right, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. We have a fantastic panel, and we are going to get to dive into the inner workings and minds of some of the most prominent business concepts here in the UAE. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start with just introducing everyone. My name is Chef Vanessa Bema. Um, I'm originally a chef trained by background, but now we run a event company and a consultancy firm. And uh, I just want to say how absolutely honored I am to be on stage with you gentlemen today. And uh, definitely am looking forward to learning so much about all of your concepts. So let's go ahead and start with uh, Zaid. Hi, my name is... Is this on? No? You guys turned it on? There we go. Back on. Thank you. Uh, first of all, happy Valentine's Day to everyone here. I hope we get to spread some uh, love and knowledge today. Uh, my name is Ziad Kamel. I am the uh, VP of Consumer at Ketopi. I have been in the food and beverage industry, in restaurants and cloud kitchens, uh, for the past 16 years, and it is a pleasure to speak to you guys today among such awesome panelists and a moderator. Thank you. Um, I am uh, Tapan Vaidya, currently the CEO at Papa John's in UAE and Saudi Arabia. We operate uh, 66 restaurants here. We opened our first in Riyadh uh, six months ago. We now have uh, eight trading. My formal education was a Bachelor of Mathematics, uh, followed by a business management uh, degree, but I started working in restaurants right from my university days, and I loved it so much, I'm still here. <laughs> Can't get rid of you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I've had uh, the good fortune of operating a um, number of uh, restaurant brands in the region and in India, including uh, Papa John's, Chili's, Burger King, Pizza Hut, um, Outback Steakhouse, the list is long. Currently, I'm focused uh, on developing and expanding Papa John's in UAE and Saudi. It's been, uh, I've been wanting to give back to the industry, uh, which has given me a lot more than I'd wished for. Um, I try my best in different ways. Uh, one of them is uh, my role as uh, a member of the advisory board of DRG, a not-for-profit organization patronized by Dubai Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much. Hello, uh, my name is Joe Fram. I am the VP of Cloud Kitchens at Talabot. I am very pleased to be here and to be part of this beautiful panel. Fabulous. Hello, okay. Um, yeah, no, still, uh, still the wrong picture, uh, but that's my chef life, uh, but I was never a chef historically, <laughs> so uh, yeah, if you want to look me up, you'll, you'll find a different picture elsewhere. Um, my name is Mike Kromke. Uh, I'm a career-long kind of strategist. Yeah, I've uh, focused on kind of growth and innovation with clients, you know, over the past kind of uh, 20 years in North America and in the region, uh, corporate uh, as well as government. You know, in, in my current role, you know, I'm leading the strategy and growth uh, for Locale. Uh, and Locale is, you know, the only kind of full stack uh, food tech brand uh, and delivery company uh, in the region. And we're a part of uh, Crush Brands. And, um, you know, for us, you know, really our, our mission is about creating a, a sustainable economic ecosystem uh, where, you know, uh, innovative foodpreneurs can thrive uh, and reconnect with the communities in which they operate. Fabulous, wow, you guys, we have a lot of talent on the stage today, and I, for one, have been very much looking forward to asking each of you something that I'm sure everyone is also very, very uh, interested to find out, is about the different types of models that you have for cloud kitchens, satellite kitchens, you know, dark kitchens, we all hear these phrases and whatnot, and even though a lot of us are here in the industry, we are unsure of how all the different models work, and all four of you have vastly different models uh, that run your operations, so I would love to hear, give us the insight. You look at me, so I guess well, I'll start. <laughs> We're going to um, go down the line. Okay, cool. <laughs> So um, yeah, dark kitchen, cloud kitchen, ghost kitchens. I, I personally don't like the world word dark kitchen because they're not dark at all. They're very, very bright if you've ever been in one. Um, and, uh, and look, what, what 
let, let's talk a bit about Kitopi's Cloud Kitchen model or Kitopi's business model. So we are a food company that is powered by cloud kitchens, technology, and also uh, uh, standard brick and mortar, bricks and mortar restaurants, QSRs, like you guys know it as well. Um, so the definition of cloud kitchen or satellite kitchen is changing as the times roll on. What's here to stay is that consumers will choose to continue to order food through online del delivery platforms, through direct channels, and through whatever tools are yet to be invented and created. Um, in addition to visiting physical restaurants and branches, whether they exist in food halls or airports or full, self, uh, full service restaurants, um, with unique experiences. So, Kitopi's business model recognizes that consumers are everywhere, and so we are, as a consumer company, as evolving as a consumer company, we are, want to be where the consumers are. So, we are solving for cloud kitchens, we're solving for QSRs, um, and we're solving for uh, dine-in locations. Um, when it comes to our cloud kitchen model, what we do is we are a multi-brand operating platform, if we want to zoom in onto the cloud kitchen model as well. We operate multiple brands within one fixed infrastructure, right? So we have, um, we have technology, we have processes, we have equipment and people that operate multiple brands that deliver from cloud kitchens and are available across all the online delivery platforms or aggregators out there. So that's basically what our model is, a multi-brand uh, cloud kitchen delivery model. Um, and that is uh, in addition to all the other things that we do as well. Thanks. Um, so five years ago, if this question were asked to you, what is common to the words cloud, ghost, and dark? You wouldn't have a clue. But the phenomenal to, growth sorry, since... Sorry, to, to me it sounds scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it's definitely caught our attention. This phenomenal growth is just unbelievable in this space. Um, but I'm probably a little bit uh, different um, in this panel in that uh, we primarily operate customer-facing restaurants. And we do a good job um, at that. Uh, you'll find our restaurants in the Enoch gas station where you fill uh, your car up. You might find our restaurants in a mall food court or in your neighborhood. Uh, but that's what we've been doing. That said, the advent of Cloud Kitchen did not uh, go unnoticed by us and we uh, started evaluating our strategy and we found a wonderful partner in uh, Kitopi with who we have uh, now, we operate from six of the kitchens and uh, both parties are committed to this relationship and we're doing very well with them. Uh, not only that, we also realized that this is something we want to get into ourselves. So we've invested in one cloud kitchen of our own. Of course, only Papa John's, uh, no other brands. Just, um, and, and the test is going very well. So um, that's the business model we are talking about. That's absolutely amazing. So basically you've taken your concept and moved it over into Katopi with all of the different aspects and applications that they're able to offer, but still holding your concept with, do you, do you send in your chefs as well? Or how exactly would you say the relationship between you and Katopi uh, uh, works? So it's a very good question. See the success for any brand operating inside a cloud kitchen, especially Papa John's inside a Kitopi kitchen, is to ensure that the consumer ultimately gets exactly the same pizza that he would get from a normal Papa John's restaurant. To make that happen, uh, both Kitopi teams and our teams work together. So often you'd find our team members, our managers in Kitopi kitchens helping Kitopi team and Kitopi teams learning about our products on a regular basis 
And that's how we've uh, been able to uh, crack uh, this code. I think QDOP teams have been uh, very good at replicating our products. That's amazing. And Joe, everybody knows Talibat. I think uh, I kind of use the app a little bit too often. <laughs> but, you know, a happy belly, happy life. Tell me, how are you um, executing your plan with your business? Brilliant. So uh, our business model is basically a real estate business model. Uh, in comparison with Kitopi or with other uh, operators, we do not touch food. We offer space. And with space, we offer value-adding services. Namely, um, so just a quick example. Five years ago, the market size was not as big as it is today, right? So one cloud kitchen, one location could serve really a big sphere and a big uh, number of, of, um, of, um, of customers. But now the market tripled and suddenly you have to serve micro communities. And then within each micro community, you need to be very targeted on what cuisines and what have you. And this is, this is one of the values that we bring to the table, which is understanding what cuisines, what brands we need to bring to what micro community. And then build the real estate there and attract these brands to these real estate. That's absolutely fabulous. So guys, we've already touched base on three different types of models and this will come into play on one of our future questions where we're gonna focus on the consumer and the clients. Um, our last speaker, Michael, who <laughs> I, I like the, the, the picture sitting in front of us versus what's on the screen. Um, tell us what sets uh, Locale apart. Yeah, so I, I think with Locale, I think the interesting thing for us is that we grew organically a bit into the position that we're in. Um, you know, we started as a, as a pizza company, uh, so Freedom Pizza, and then kind of grew into other brands. Uh, and, and what we learned is we, we needed to, uh, to remain profitable and relevant. You know, we needed to own the value chain. Uh, so we needed to develop our own technology. Uh, we needed to develop our own brands. Uh, we needed to have efficient operations within our kitchens. And we needed to have our own delivery drivers. Um, with this value chain pulled together, it ends up that the economics are still there for the restaurant. Um, so ultimately for us, kind of the key goal is to create kind of unit economics uh, at our scale, uh, which is not the scale of, you know, our, our, uh, my friends here, um, and, and then we can grow, uh, and then we can grow in a marketable way. Uh, so you know, if you think about first to describe our business is, is what we don't do. So first is, you know, we don't try to make money on technology. Uh, you know, we do it, we do it well. Uh, we don't try to make money on advertising. We don't have advertising on our platform. Our brands speak for themselves. Uh, we don't try to make money again on delivery. Delivery is a cost center. It's a super tough business. You need to be efficient at it, and that's about it. Um, and we don't make money on our real estate footprint of multi-kitchens. You know, that is essentially where we drive uh, efficiency in the business, uh, in which enables us to kind of delight our customers. You know, what we do do is we partner with great foodpreneurs. Uh, so these are people who are passionate uh, about, you know, their product, uh, fanatical about their customers. Uh, and we partner with these individuals uh, on a joint equity basis uh, to, to build their business, and we make money on food. It sounds crazy, but in the, in the food industry, we make money on food. Um, and, you know, how do we help them? Because uh, there's a lot of challenges to get started these days as, as, a, as a foodpreneur. One, you know, we help support in the initial CapEx outlays uh, as it relates to kind of the kitchens. We're investing in that. Uh, we're also supporting them in their branding, marketing, everything in the back of the house. Uh, and then as they grow, we co-invest because we're true partners with them in their business. Uh, and we provide them uh, all of the back office support uh, that a lot of people that are foodpreneurs uh, either don't have you know the previous knowledge in doing or shouldn't be focusing on. Um, so for us, ultimately, our business model is built upon you know, driving brand economics in the kitchen. Uh, and because of our relationship with these foodpreneurs, with these partners, uh, as a corporate, uh, we also uh, are profitable. That's amazing. Actually, I, you've given us so much knowledge on these subjects. And the first thing that kind of pops into my mind, a lot of our clients ask us as well as, we are always looking for ways of moving forward in our industry. And a lot of, as you probably all know, is that a lot of the clients that come to you or joint venture partnerships or brands that come to you, everyone thinks they have a great idea. 
Everyone has a fantastic idea, whether it be a chef or just a gentleman who does like food in general. What would you say for them to sit and think about? Because like, for example, I'm lucky enough to be a businesswoman and a chef. But if another chef comes to me with an idea without even thinking about what their FCRs are going to be, what the aggregators are going to require, if they want to be in the kitchen cooking the food or if they would like um, the cloud kitchen to handle everything, what would you say is probably the best piece of advice that you could give these food entrepreneurs? Food, foodpreneur, guys, that's definitely something we're going to have to remember after this conversation. So what would you advise, what would be the best bit of advice would you say to someone that's approaching your particular business model? And we'll start down the line. <laughs> All right, so we get asked this question a lot. And um, there, I guess there, it's from two, the, let's segregate who asked the question. One, someone with an existing food concept or restaurant or brand. And two, the person who has the next, or who he or she thinks have the next best idea in food and beverage, and they just need to launch it on delivery, and it's going to do amazing, right? So those are generally the two buckets of people who come and ask the question. Let's tackle the first one. So if you have an existing restaurant um, or a chain of restaurants, and uh, you would like to expand your footprint nationally or internationally, um, then probably the very good way or a very good strategy to consider is finding a cloud kitchen partner who can uh, allow you to expand without the heavy capex investment required to do so yourself. Um, in this manner, it will. There's two models, right? There is the real estate model. There are cloud kitchen providers that provide you the real estate and allow the operator to move in their staff, their equipment, their food, and operate it. On a, uh, on a commercial agreement which may be fixed rent or may be linked to revenue or a bit of both. So that's one mode to do it. The other mode to do it is to work with a cloud kitchen operator or company like Kitopi. Uh, who, and what Kitopi does is we handle um, the full operations, right? And it's more like a franchise model where we pay the brand uh, royalties on their revenue and we handle the entire operation, and we operate based on the brand standards. So that's the licensing model. Now, for that to be successful, the brand needs to have adequate equity. Consumers must um, demand the brand. Uh, the econ economics must make sense. Uh, the brand must be passionate enough and knowledgeable enough to market their brand and communicate their brand in these zones or delivery zones which they're going to operate in. And most importantly, the brand needs to be super organized in its operations. They need a solid supply chain. They need uh, people who can train, people who can quality control, and people who can market their brand. Uh, and so that, that would be uh, the second model. And um, there's a lot of synergies that come along with it. So when we work with... Uh, uh, Tapan and his team on Papa John's, they have all that. They're an amazing brand, they're an excellent operating partner, and it's more like a partnership uh, where we grow and scale the brand together. And you know, they, they, uh, they, they work with Kitopi as a partner, as one of their uh, growth levers, in addition to all the other growth le levers which, uh, which they have. Uh, now, if you are a foodpreneur or you think your mom bakes the best lasagna and you want to open a lasagna concept. I think we've all heard that from every single one of our friends. Oh, wait, right. I have a concept for you. I have a great idea. It's missing. My friend, my mom, my chef. And uh, I think we'll sell tons of, tons of food if we put on delivery. Now, this is slightly more complicated. Perhaps around four or five years ago, um, it was easier because cloud kitchens needed people like that to come in and, and trial, the, trial the system and, uh, and set up uh, because a lot of the, the established food companies were, were, were more on the trajectory of doing things themselves. Um, so today, today, if you have a great idea or you think you have a great idea, before you can even... Uh, so again, there's two avenues. You can, you can take the risk yourselves, rent a cloud kitchen, uh, uh, do the real estate model, fill it up with your team, with your equipment and your concept, and you can see how it goes for the proof of concept. Uh, the other licensing model will be slightly more difficult. 
uh, because to work with a company that um, will invest a lot in your brand, they, you need to prove that your brand uh, has what it takes to succeed. Now, if you, this typically, this typically works if you have an audience first, product second strategy, which means if you are a major influencer and you can attract demand for your brand through your social media channels. If you have one, two million followers on social media who already follow you and you, you are your own brand, then perhaps you can, it's worth looking at converting that into, uh, into a food brand and maybe that will be worth the while for cloud kitchen operators like Kitopi to uh, invest in helping you get there. Um, so. I hope I answered the question. I think, I, I think you answered that question in like my next five ones. <laughs> uh, definitely. Uh, no, that, that completely makes sense. Um, I, I would have to agree as well that uh, I'm sure the rest of the panel would agree with me when it comes to if you have a concept, you need to find the right fit. You know, um, working with Katopi, they do have a range of options, as he mentioned, you know, to pan with... Uh, uh, Papa John's is currently working with them where they have their chefs in with a, a checks and balances system as well as it, with Katopi that you're able to just have them run it as a franchisee. Uh, Talabat, from my understanding, um, you can use their space and their renting out space uh, to be able to, to execute your vision and they obviously probably help you get listed with the aggregators. Um, and finally, with Michael as well, is that he's using a very good core base of clientele and uh, executional processes to be able to get your brand to stand apart so that it's not meshed with any of the other brands. Now, my next question um, that is open to the panel, whoever wants to dive in, is, you know, we all come see things come and go. What is your opinion on cloud kitchens and satellite kitchens being a fad. What would your answer be? Do you think it's a fad? Do you think it's here for the long haul? Uh, how do you feel it will evolve moving forward? I can take that. Okay. Not a fad at all. Not a fad at, Not at all. all. Well, you would know. You've been here since 1988, is that correct? 1989, yes. 1989. So please tell us more. I mean, um, Okay, let me go back to 1991 it was, Pizza Hut time for me, and for the first time ever, we were launching home delivery. In those days, uh, no, uh, I mean every street was not numbered or named, um, every household did not have a number outside its door. It was difficult. I would imagine that's a great challenge. How are you supposed to find the house at the end of the third street down the road? So what we did, <laughs> we of course first defined the trade area and then every, we created a code for every household. And the code included um, the road that we had named, not <laughs> the municipality. The road, so the block, the road, the building and the floor and finally, as you climb up the stairs, counting from the right side, which is anti-clockwise, the door's position. So you read the code and you will know exactly where it is, the house. And the first campaign was titled, Dial D for Delivery. Really? Yes, based on the Dial M for Murder of uh, Hitchcock. <laughs> That's amazing. But, but so, uh, and, and in those days, people thought this is a fad. Home delivery, oh, customers are coming to restaurants, they come for takeaway, they come to eat, they come to dine. It's a fad, is it? It's not going anywhere. If anything, I think it's going to just completely morph into its own animal. Absolutely, and neither are cloud kitchens going away. This is the future, in fact, what you're seeing today is probably just a small iota of the final picture. Uh, it, this is just going to grow. And if you're not on this bandwagon, then you are missing out, is what I would say. Uh, fully agree. Um, you know, I think it's, it's a part of an omni-channel approach. Um, and, you know, Cloud Kitchen is a, is a format. 
Uh, and it's, a, it's an evolution of kind of what you saw and what Tavan said. You know, first you had a restaurant you dined in, then you had takeaway, then you had delivery, and now you have multi, multi-brand delivery within kitchens. It's a format, and your brands need to kind of fit, fit within that om, omni-channel kind of view of the world. Um, when we think about brands as it, as it relates to kind of multi-kitchens and these formats, they need to be able to live in all of them. Uh, you can't build a dark brand or a menu. Uh, you need a brand that has someone behind it, someone that's passionate about it, um, and someone that's trying to be you know, looking after the customer, kind of fanatical about what they're doing in driving that business. Uh, and you know, that's our view, is that as we kind of think about a cloud kitchen, of course it's here to stay, uh, but as you think about building a brand, building a concept, uh, you need to be able to touch all of these channels um, and similarly, from a technology perspective, uh, so as we think about tech, um, it's, it's across all of these channels. You know, of course, now locale is something where you engage from a cloud kitchen perspective. It has applications in food halls. It apl- has applications in dine-in. It's a way for our customers to engage with us uh, as brands uh, and with the foodpreneurs that are passionate about the food. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, I know, I, I could see you definitely have something you want to share. Please, go ahead. Uh, look, I think uh, what Tapan and Michael shared are, are spot on, right? Just to add to, to Tapan, uh, from an aggregator-led point of view, um, we believe that, the, so historically, the relationship between aggregators and restaurants was um, as a marketplace, then it evolved to become a delivery service, then now it's evolving to become more of a, an asset, uh, they offer you an asset where you can operate, and then this relationship will further deepen uh, on technology, definitely, and eventually giving the foodpreneurs and all the restaurants the opportunity to do what they do best, which is creation, which is do food, right? And then making sure that all the other services, and it goes from anywhere from, from procurement to, uh, to financing your, 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 your equipment, all these support services, all of these privileges that some have, uh, but many don't, this will become democratized for the best to prevail. And, and this is the beauty of it. Now, there is an intrinsic driver for all of this, which is profitability. In any industry where there is pressure on profitability, there is it results through aggregation. Any industry, you name it. And this is happening today in the food industry. And this is why we see that the offering, this, this offering called Cloud Kitchens, it's not about here to stay. It is needed for people, to stay, for restaurants to stay. So it helps restaurants grow. The lack of it is going to create further pressure on these same restaurants to become profitable. You know, your, your response actually brings up another question that I, I personally have. Moving forward and seeing how everything has been driven forward at the current moment, what about reverse launching? We're talking about most people are used to brick and mortar, right? But let, let, let's, let's play a game. I do not have the finances to open up my own restaurant. I may have the know-how, I might have the will, the drive, etc. Your platforms allow a person, a chef, as myself, to be able to launch in a manner that has low overhead, all right? We can use our joint venture partnerships with the extensive knowledge that you all have and possess and that has been working for you and your partners. But what about a reverse launch? What about those chefs that want to start with you first and if it goes well, then we can open up our uh, business fronts, our brick and mortar. What do you think about that? Uh, we're, we're doing that. Uh, so we, we go both ways. Um, so one way is obviously if you have a, uh, somebody who has a concept, has one location, two locations, they need to scale, they need to grow, we can partner that with them for growth. Um, you know, we're also engaged with, with chefs, you know, people who have, have a job somewhere else, uh, and they want to create a business, they want to change their life, they want to do something where they have an opportunity to actually have ownership uh, in, what they're, in what they're doing. Um, and, and we're engaging with those people, right? Uh, so this is literally every week, I probably have four or five different conversations with different people. Um, 
you know, what do we look for in those people? You know, they need to have a great product. Whatever it is, doesn't matter. Hands down, has to be a great product. Uh, number two, they need to be fanatical about their customers. Um, if they're not fanatical about their customers, whether that's engagement through social media or even in-person engagement, um, you know, that doesn't really work for us. Uh, they need to have a drive and passion and a purpose. So why are they actually doing this? They need a story around why they're doing this. What is the passion? Why are they actually doing this? It's not just a menu. Um, and then lastly, it's, it's ultimately their business, so they need driving determination of an entrepreneur. Uh, so whether they have a majority or minority equity stake, uh, they're the brand ambassadors. They're the people that have to keep uh, everybody honest. Uh, and, uh, and the accountability as well, the 100%. accountability for the brand, which is quite important. 100%. So I guess for us, it goes both ways, and, and we're, we're actively engaging with uh, exactly the people that you've described to kind of help support them. This is fabulous. Uh, you guys, just listening to everything today, I'm sure there are a lot of you out there that have thought about this, about how to either improve your current uh, brick and motar or to take your concept to the next level and as we can see here this literally is the future and it is something that's going to evolve moving forward so my next thing is if you had to make a prophetic estimation of where you see your business going in the next five years I really would like you to share that with us right now and I'll start with you because I like picking on you <laughs> I think as Mike was saying, the, the future is omni-channel. It's not just one channel wins it all. You have to be everywhere where the consumer is. And um, if we take a step back, Cloud Kitchen's always existed. I think uh, maybe Domino's was one of the first to operate delivery-only sites, effectively being Cloud Kitchens. All the hotels that you would order room service from operated in the basement as a dark kitchen. Right, so what's the difference between then and now? Yes, it's connectivity, it's internet, we live in a connected age, and logistics, right? When we solve for logistics and uh, being connected to Web 2.0 and now Web 3.0, I think that's where the changes uh, will happen. So um, I think with the advent of AI and technology and solving for logistics, uh, we will see a lot of changes in the way uh, food delivery is being uh, manifested, right? So w with a lot of predictive algorithms, understanding consumer behavior, uh, understanding your needs and wants, what you like, what you don't like, we're going to enter an age of mass customization and personalization. So products that is per, are personalized and customized per individual consumer. This is what the infrastructure is leading to us today. With regards to real estate development, a lot of developers and city planners are taking note now and understanding the, the ways of the cloud kitchen and how they can add value to a community and where the pain points are and how to solve for them um, when it comes to lo uh, logistics, that's also being delivered. Are we going to live in a world where uh, deliveries are fulfilled by humans on motorcycles, or is that going to be optimized? So I think we'll see on all these fronts, with the help of technology and connectivity, uh, uh, wonderful ways in which uh, food is delivered to the consumer. So that's, uh, that's what I have point. to say about it, generally. And how no, about you, I, Japan? Yeah, so uh, I agree with everything you've said. Uh, um, as far as Papa John's concerned, we're definitely going to keep growing uh, customer-facing restaurants as well as uh, through uh, dark kitchens. But I think as far as uh, apologies for using the word dark, um, as far as cloud kitchens and the future goes, you know, I, we will see a lot of innovation. Um, and we have seen a lot of innovation already. We have seen that in the US, uh, companies have started um, parking vessels in parking lots, using that resource to build cloud kitchens. We have seen um, cloud kitchen operators taking over kitchens, central kitchen of hotels. 
and putting that to good use. That's um, an excellent, I just want you to elaborate a little bit more about that. That's, that's actually something probably new to us and the audience. Um, having the cloud kitchen taking hotel space, this is, this is very interesting. I think, uh, I, I'd like to think we are not that new. Uh, I think many hotels in uh, the UAE have gone to uh, cloud uh, kitchens and it works for everyone. Uh, the hotel uh, doesn't have to invest in, uh, well, the hotel actually has CapEx invested, it's put to good use, um, but the hotel saves on payroll because the cloud kitchen operator will run uh, the kitchen. Um, hotel guests get good food. Not only that, the hotel earns uh, money not only from the food sold to the hotel guests, but also to the food delivered in the neighborhood. So it's a win-win for the hotel, it's a win-win, uh, it's a win situation for the cloud operator and the consumers in the area. So I think this, and, and what will happen is this innovation will continue. One day, I think, you will find hospitals having cloud kitchens. One day, you might find, uh, you know, public parks having a corner with cloud kitchens. You know, this, this will never end. I promise you, it's not a fad. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Joe? Yeah, look, by the way, we are in conversations with hospitals that, um, that, <laughs> that are proposing this. <laughs> Um, look, if I divide it into, into three, uh, three horizons, right? In the short term, we absolutely see um, uh, this cloud kitchen concept uh, mushrooming everywhere, right? Uh, and uh, my, my view is that the regulators now see that this is not just an idea. So now there is definitely an effort that will be done on a regulation point of view to understand this concept and shape it in a way that will make these businesses profitable. One. In the medium term, I believe that there will be a very strong tech, um, tech enablement, right? We've heard from, from, from the session before that there are a lot of tech companies that are powering these cloud kitchens. I believe that this will become a standard Every restaurant today will have access to this. This will not be something that, that will become um, a luxury, right? Um, and in the third horizon, I believe that the value-adding services, such as access to uh, affordable ingredient, right? Um, affordable and just in time, because today we are facing a massive uh, supply chain crisis. So many of the restaurants today are facing uh, procurement issues. How can we make sure that within this environment called cloud kitchens, we can s serve and support and solve for these issues? That's going to be on the long term, whereby every restaurant will be able to say, you know what, my chicken are going to be delivered on that day at that price without having to worry about this. That's very true. That's very true. And Michael? Yeah, so uh, I guess if, if, coming back to the value chain conversation, you know, if you think about the various aspects of it, we will be getting more efficiency across. And I think a lot of these pieces were mentioned, whether it be through tech, efficiency in kitchen, real estate footprint, I think delivery through drivers is tough, but maybe there's something else that we can do to, to help fix that. Um, inherently, though, what we need to do is, is have a sustainable economic model uh, where there is inherent value created uh, within that value chain. And you know, I think what we're starting to see is in, in the capital markets is that you know, investors aren't as interested anymore in, in funding uh, potentially profitable models in the future. So you know, I think there's going to be a big shift uh, where a lot of us are, uh, you know, need to refocus and re-engage on ensuring that there is core profitability in the model which can be scaled. Because uh, you know, it's going to be challenging to uh, get funding uh, to push it. Well, we have a bright future ahead of us, and it seems it's all positive at this point. And as we all know, um, any obstacles that do come in our way, we can definitely tackle them. Uh, guys, I have uh, just a couple minutes left. I just wanted to ask the audience that it's a very rare opportunity that you have such talent and knowledge sitting in the same room at the same time. Did anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Okay, great. I'm coming. Bear with me. Oh, wonderful. 
We have a runner. We have a runner. Great. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Ali. I'm from India. So uh, during the pandemic, we had uh, set up a very uh, disruptive idea in the cloud kitchen space. And uh, over a period of 20 months, we have grown 10 times in size and revenue. And now we are looking into getting into uh, Middle East, starting uh, right from Dubai. So we have a very ambitious uh, aspiration of uh, opening around 100 cloud kitchens in the next three to four years. So I was wondering how can these, uh, I think now Kitopi has gone into like a white labeling kind of a service where they, the model which he explained very clearly. So does Talabat also have a similar kind of a concept where we can make use of your infrastructure for a rental model or a revenue sharing model? So how would someone else from outside UAE come into, uh, I mean, yeah, outside UAE come and set up their business over here? I guess that question is for me. It's a good question. It's, it's a very, a very good, good question. question. Thank you. So, uh, Ali, I think you have, you have two options. The first option is to move in part of your operations to the Middle East so we can build off of it, right? And it depends based on your willingness for uh, uh, your, risk, your risk appetite how much you want to move into. Um, one point which is very important is if you want to maintain your central kitchen operations, you got you to gotta move. If you wish not to, there is another way, which is through our concepts, which is we somehow, similar to what Kitopi does, license the operations of your brand and potentially go to Kitopi and tell them, hey guys, can you operate on behalf of that, uh, of that brand? So in, in both ways, what is very, very important is that Product customization is extremely important to be memorable in the mind of uh, customers that are facing m thousands of brands. If, if you would do now a small test and open your app and just check how many restaurants there are, it's absurd. So whatever you do, what, what is very important is customization and product adaptation. Excellent, excellent. Um, let me just check. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, I'm going to take one final question, please. Uh, I will take this gentleman here. Now, please right. remember, guys, at the end, if you'd like to speak with any of our panelists, I'm sure that they'd be happy to discuss with you. Uh, we just want to keep within our time for the actual panel. Please, sir, what is your question? Uh, first of all, congratulations to all of you for your businesses. Um, my, my question was um, about sustainability. I mean, uh, we know that you are supplying a large number of meals every day to millions of customers, right? And uh, we see a lot of motorcycles on the streets as well, delivering, you know, in all the corners of Dubai. Um, so what, what's the best ecological strategy that any of you have, you know, to, because it's a big challenge. I think it's one of the main topics of this uh, event as well, just to hear someone like what what's the strategy of one of your business regarding sustainability i wish we could have drones but that's just me and my sci-fi <laughs> yeah sure all right um look i think one great example of this is if you visit expo 2020 and you check the kitchen that we've built over there it gives you a sense of where the trend is going and how we are becoming more sustainable and eco-friendly we are leveraging uh, e-scooter, electric scooters. Um, we are focusing also on a, a service that is based on um, 3D printing uh, that is non-abusive to the environment, sustainable 3D printing. Um, we have robots to support currently uh, drivers in their, in their operations. Um, obviously, this has constraints. Because today, building on Tapan's point, asking a robot to go to the third floor on the right-hand side is going <laughs> to be a bit difficult. The AI is not that advanced. But obviously, we will leverage multiple techniques to reduce as much as possible our, our environmental footprint. Now, from a construction point of view, it is definite, construction and operations, it is definite that there are multiple practices that we're using from um, how we, how we recycle oil to uh, our audits that are paper-free, paper right? So we adopt all these techniques inside our kitchens to ensure that down the line, we are prepared for a full environmental 
uh, transformation. Absolutely fabulous. Guys, if you could just give a big round of applause to our panelists today. Thank you so much for joining us.